Okay, so we are going to finish up these vascular plants. Let me close this. Vascular plants that uh, shed spores. So we just learned a, a kind of a bit about those and also we went through the ferns. And so now we're gonna go on by uh, digging into the lycopods. So lycopods are in the phylum Lycopodiophyta, right? Lycopodiophyta, Lycopodiophyta, right? Phylum name. And this is uh, some representative lycopods shown here. Uh, lycopods come from the Greek leukos, which means wolf, and pus, which means foot. And whoops, where is this going here? And it's the oldest surviving group of vascular plants, which is really interesting to me, but really interesting. <laughs> um, so, so over evolutionary time, geological time, there's been a lot of different vascular plants that have come and gone, you know, gone extinct. Uh, but lycopods, which showed up around, based on the fossil record, around 400 million years ago, are still, there are still representatives of lycopods today, making them, to our knowledge, the oldest surviving group of vascular plants, uh, which is Whoa. And you don't need to know how many species, but just know that there are a, a good amount of living species of lycopods, but there's even more extinct species of lycopods. Uh, based, well, who knows, maybe not more, but there's a lot of extinct species of lycopods as well. And as these are in the vascular plants, right, the sporophyte generation is going to be your dominant generation. Yeah, so. So lycopod, if you like see here, this is these are examples of lycopods on the bottom, right? And the word lycopod comes from from wolf's foot, right? Lucos pus. And uh, so I guess whoever was naming lycopods when they first learned about or were describing them, they thought that this shape here, look kind of like like if you see here on the left, it looked kind of like a wolf's foot. I, I guess I can kind of see it, but um, but that's where the name comes from. All right. In the lycopods, right, in the in the phylum Lycopodiophyta, the two largest genera are the genus Lycopodium and the genus Selaginella. So Lycopodium, as a, you know, as a member of Lycopodiophyta, it makes sense. Lycopodium, that makes sense, right? You still have the Lycopod part in it. But Selaginella is also a genus in Lycopodiophyta, and so it's also a lycopod. So when we use, so before we go into that, when we use the term lycopod, we're referring to the nickname of the phylum, of the phylum Lycopodiophyta. <clears throat> uh, the genus Lycopodium has not that many species, uh, around 400, and they're still kind of debating, you know, whether it's, you know, is it really, is Lycopodium really made up of 15 different things that should be different genera, but don't worry about that. But just know that there's quite a few species. In Selaginella, there's even more. <clears throat> uh, and most of the species of lycopods are tropical, and the sporophyte plants are either growing in the ground terrestrially, or they are growing on other plants like epiphytes. Is there anything else there? No. So here on the left, we see an example of lycopods growing terrestrially, right, growing out of the ground. And on the right, lycopods growing as an epiphyte off of other plants. Uh, here, so this is examples in Lycopodium. Here's examples in Selaginella of them growing terrestrially on the left and then as an epiphyte on the right, growing off of other plants. Lycopods have adventitious roots. We learned about the word adventitious roots in the root lab. Adventitious just means that the roots are coming directly off the stem, or directly off the stem, not at the, the bottom or anything like that. The stem, is, the stem of lycopods, similar to a fern, grows horizontally, and so as, the, as it grows, roots will come out of that horizontal stem. And the leaf of lycopods is a microphyll. So when we talked about the ferns, ferns had leaves that were megaphylls, right? What were megaphylls? Leaves that had more than one vein. And so 
if you have not a megafill, if you have something else, it's a microfill. What is a microfill? Well, you might have guessed. Microfill is a leaf that has only one vein, right? If a megafill is a leaf that has more than one vein, a microfill is a leaf that only has one vein. And we don't need to get into the evolution of it right now, but um, but microfills are the more ancestral leaf form, right? In the in the fossil record and based on what we know, microfills showed up before megafill showed up. Okay. Yeah, so one vein. So this is a close-up of a lycopod. And each of these little spikies, each of these spikies is a microfill. Right. The word fill or the ending fill, as we saw with megafill, refers to leaf. Micro, in this case, refers to a one veined leaf. Later in this class today, we're going to use micro in a different context. And for the rest of the labs, the micro will be used in the context that we're going to use later in today's class. But in the lycopods, microfill means a single veined leaf. Okay. Uh, right. So some micro, so lycopods have microfills, and in some cases, the microfills have sporangia on top of them. And if the microfills have sporangia on top of them, we call them sporophills. So fill again is leaf, and sporo refers to like sporophyte, right? Sporophyll is a leaf that has sporangium on it. That's what I, yep, so that's what I just said, right? So sporophylls are leaves that are going to, uh, that have structures on them that ultimately produce spores. Sometimes the sporophylls, so the leaves bearing sporangia, look just like the other microfills that don't have sporangia. Sometimes they look just the same, and sometimes they're a little different meaning sometimes they're a little bit smaller, sometimes they're non-photosynthetic. So we're talking about the sporophylls. Sometimes the sporophylls are smaller than the leaves without sporangia. Sometimes the sporophylls are not green, meaning they're not photosynthetic. And sometimes the sporophylls are organized into a new structure that's called a strobilis or plural stroboli. We will see what that is on subsequent slides. Okay, so, Let's look at what that is. So here, here in figure one, this is an example of where the sporophylls look identical to the photosynthetic leaves. So each of these here, down here, are, are microfills without spor sporangia on them. Up here, we have the leaves that do have sporangia on them, and the sporangia are these little yellow things. But if you didn't look at the yellow things and you just looked at the leaves, they look identical to the leaves that don't have sporangia on them. And this is a, a, a different example, kind of, uh, which we talked about on the previous slide, the different changes that could happen. So sometimes the sporophylls are morphologically different in that they're smaller. So, so these up here, these things up here, this right here is what's called a strobilis. And on that strobilis are a bunch of sporophylls. In this case, the sporophylls are not green, right? The leaves down here are green, but the leaves on the sporophylls are not green. Uh, the leaves on the sporophylls on the strobilis are not green, so they're not doing photosynthesis. And they're smaller. And the reason they're smaller is because basically the idea of a strobilis, a strobilis is a stem with sporophylls on it. And the idea is like you're trying to get more leaves into a smaller area, more leaves that have sporangia on them into a smaller area. Why is this computer making so much noise? Uh, let me turn this off. One second, because that's really making a lot of noise. Right, 
that should quiet it down in a second. All right. Yeah. So the, that's the idea of a strobilis. The idea of a strobilis is that you have more leaves per area and each of those leaves has a sporangium. And so you have more sporangia on a plant as versus if you didn't have them organized in a sporangium as versus if you did not have them organized in a strobilis um, where they're more spread out. Okay. Sorry. Uh, multitasking. Okay. So here is the same thing again, right? Um, this is just showing it better up here. These are examples of microfills. They don't have any sporangia on them. Down here are the sporophylls, which are microfills with a sporangia on top of them. If you were to look very close at this, you would see here is that sporophyll. On top of that sporophyll is a sporangium, and inside of that sporangium is where the spores are going to be made. Okay. This is the, showing the same thing. It's just showing it real uh, under, I guess both of these are real, but this is a better microscope slide showing the exact same thing. So this here is a sporophyll leaf. Here is that sporangium that's on top of that sporophyll leaf. And inside of that sporangium are uh, where the spores are gonna be made. All right. So that's kind of an overview of lycopods. Now let's talk about the two genera that are that we're going to talk about, the uh, lycopodium and then selaginella. So lycopodium, there's a few different kinds that are very common in our region. <clears throat> Again, you don't have to memorize these names. I just want to show you the differences so that you can kind of understand better what I was talking about on the previous slide. So here's an example of shining club moss. The maps on the bottom show where the species is found in the um, in the USA and Canada. Uh, and this is an example of a species that doesn't have strobilis. Uh, the leaves are, they look just, the sporophylls look just like the leaves that don't bear sporangia. Um, and we say that the leaves are born singly. Born singly just means they're on their own, one, one at a time, individual as versus arranged. They're not, these are not arranged in a strobilis, they're just born singly. I think we, I think we uh, had that born singly in the first lab when we were talking about different conifers. Oh yeah, fascicles and stuff, we, we had that term before. This is another example, this is stiff club moss. This is an example of a lycopodium that has its sporophylls arranged in a strobilis. Um, so that is located here. You can see, so here, here's a bunch of them. Here's a strobilis on top of this one. Here's a strobilis on top of this one. And here's a close-up of the strobilis of the of this species, much more widely distributed in our region. And in the case of this strobilis, the strobilis doesn't have a stalk elevating it. It's just right attached right to the top of the regular microfills. Um, in some cases, the lycopodium will have the strobilis on top of a stalk, and sometimes many, many strobilis per stalk. And so the idea is, you look at how much more, so each of these strobilis has a lot of leaves on it, and all of those leaves have a sporangia on it. And so just like, look how much you can achieve if you have a strobilis and, and even more a strobilis that's on a stalk. Because if you're releasing spores into the wind, it's better to be a little elevated. Okay. All right, so that's kind of covering a little bit about the sporophyte of lycopodium. Now let's look at what the gametophytes are gonna look like. So just like we saw in the ferns, and actually, just like we saw during the non-vascular plants, but we really, didn't really talk about it, lycopodium only produces one spore type, one spore type. And depending on the species, the, oh, or sorry, lycopodium only produces one spore type. And just like we saw in ferns, and just like we saw in the non-vascular plants, this gametophyte plant is going to grow outside of the spore, outside of the spore. Um, depending on the species, let me go to the next slide. Small and not, right, yes. So 
this is talking about the gametophyte. The gametophyte is going to grow outside of the spore. The gametophyte is going to be small and non-vascular, and it's going to have rhizoids like we saw in the ferns. But depending on the species, uh, and the lab mentions this, depending on the species of Lycopodium, sometimes the gametophyte is photosynthetic, looks kind of like a little green blob like we've seen other gametophytes look like. And then sometimes it almost looks like a little carrot or a little turnip or something like that, and it's not photosynthetic. Lab mentions this, so I figured I would mention it too. This is alternation of generations in Lycopodium. So let's go through this. So this, this is the summary slide showing you all of the steps of alternation of generations in Lycopodium. Let's go through it um, to kind of understand what we're talking about. So I'll change colors to, let's do, oh, I'll go with my blue for diploid and yellow for haploid. So here is our sporophyte plant. Actually, hold on, no. <laughs> Here is our sporophyte plant, right? Here that is that horizontal rhizome again. In this case, this species does have their spor sporophylls arranged in strobily. And in the, the case of this species, it's also elevated on a stem. Here are the adventitious, here, let me get out of this. Here are the adventitious roots, right? Coming off of this horizontal stem. There's another one here. And in this case, this, this sporophyte is still developing uh, to be independent, so it's still attached to the gametophyte at this point. Um, but the sporophyte plant has already grown, you know, its stem. The sporophyte plant has already grown its roots. And so the gametophyte plant will, will disintegrate very quickly from this point because the sporophyte plant doesn't need it anymore, can do its own thing. So if we were to do a close-up of this strobilus and look at one of the strobilus, here we would see this is a stem of the strobilus, and then attached to the stem is all the sporophylls. So these are the leaves on the strobilus that are going to have the sporangia, right? They're on both sides. If we were going to look at a close-up of one of these sporangia, right, here's what it would look like inside of the sporangias where you have that spore producing tissue that's going to be able to undergo meiosis and make spores, right, sporophyll. Right, this is what we saw before, just as a reminder that sporophylls are leaves that bear sporangia. Okay. Um, yeah, so this is where we left off on the previous, right, here we are in the sporangium. Now meiosis is going to occur of those spore on those spore producing cells such that the spore producing cells are going to turn into spores that are haploid right because we went through meiosis and eventually the sporangium is going to rupture or open and then the spores are going to fly out on the wind here is a spore flying out on the wind and the spore is starting to open and the gametophyte plant Sorry, yeah, and the gametophyte plant is starting to grow out of it or germinate out of it. Now the gametophyte plant is growing larger. So here, here is the gametophyte plant growing larger. Remember, the gametophyte plant is growing outside of the spore wall, outside of the spore in, in Lycopodium. Lycopodium only makes one kind of spore. And the gametophyte plant is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And because it's a gametophyte plant, it's going to have sex organs, right? It's going to have archegonia. It's going to have antheridia. And inside of an archegonium, you're going to have an egg. Inside of an antheridium, you're going to have sperm producing cells. Just a reminder, right, the sporophyte plant only makes one type of spore in Lycopodium. The gametophyte plant grows outside of the spore. And in the case of this, the gametophyte plant is, is what you could say, the gametophyte plant is monoecious. Uh, you can start putting those terms together because on one gametophyte plant, you have uh, both male and female sex organs. Okay, oh, get out of annotate. Um, cool. So. 
yeah, this should be starting to feel hopefully a little familiar, right? So the antheridium is going to release sperm, right? Here they are leaving the antheridium. This is a close-up of them, funky looking. And then the egg is waiting inside of the archegonium. Sperm will swim. The, the cells of the archegonium neck cells will, will disintegrate, opening it, and the sperm is going to swim to meet the egg uh, and fuse, which is called fertilization. And once fertilization occurs, then you have your two end zygote, which is still inside of the archegonium, right? Because that's where the egg was. And now the sporophyte plant is going, so the two end zygote, two end diploid zygote is going to grow via mitosis to become an embryo and then get slightly bigger until we are back at the beginning into the full mature sporophyte generation. Yeah, so you can see like alternation of gen generations has a lot of the same, every plant does it and uh, there's a lot of the same patterns there, but every, you know, there's just little tweaks here and there, right? Like, like a podium has sometimes a strobilis. Um, when we looked at the ferns, the gametophyte plant is heart-shaped and in the lycopodium, the gametophyte plant's not heart-shaped. It's either a little green blob or a little carrot looking thing. So, you know, there's little tweaks here and there, but the, the overall pattern is the same. doesn't matter what plant you're talking about. All right, let's talk about Selaginella. So we did the lycopods lycopodium. Now let's do lycopods Selaginella. All right. Selaginella, um, pretty much, I think I have a thing here. Yeah, I do. Selaginella always has strobili. Um, so there on the left, top left, you see a close-up of a strobilis. And on the right, you see many of them, right, strobili. If you were to look at the tips of these under the microscope, these are the tips of the, of the shoot system, you would see strobili there. And this is another example of Selaginella that still has strobili. Here they look like this. There's three strobili right there, what, four and a half strobili right there. This Selaginella is actually really cool in that it, um, it's called the resurrection plant, which is really neat, and I'll show you why. Uh, let's take this out of here. I think that will make this calm down. It's still making too much noise from my liking. Yeah, this is called resurrection plant, and I'll show you why. So this plant lives in the desert. If I can get out of here, escape. Here we go. This plant lives in the desert where it won't have water for a really, 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 really long time. And then when exposed to water, so let's say in the desert, let's, let's pause this for a second. So this plant is hanging out in the desert for, it could be years, it could be years with no rain, no rain at all. And it looks dead. It almost looks like a little tumbleweed or something. It looks dead. It's all dried out. But then all rain comes. And when the rain comes, it has to take advantage of that. And so it is going to go from looking completely dead to fully alive in just a few hours. Uh, this is a time lapse. There's a, at the very bottom right, you can see the, the time lapse. But check this out. So this is a resurrection plant type of Selaginella that somebody put in a bowl and then videotaped it uh, for hours. So check this out, look at it. So this is only minutes going by. It's, it's not even been one hour and it's already starting to fully come back al alive, right? Look at this. So now it's been a few hours now. I don't even know, I should check if this is hours. This, this might actually be minutes, I have to check. I'll look, I'll look back to figure that out. But look at that, fully opened in a very short, yeah, this must be minutes because look at this little thing from floating by. Fully open in just a very short period of time. So that's that's just so cool. Again, these are all available on, um, oh, this is being so loud. These are all available on the Blackboard page uh, in the YouTube section, YouTube video section. Just gonna close this. Maybe that'll make it calm down. I've had the same computer my whole time during my grad work, and so it's hung in there. But it's sometimes it has little fits. Okay, so yeah, so look here, before and after, 
in just a few little very short period of time totally, totally wakes up so there you go there's a strobe leaf okay so this is this is where we have a little change here so all the plants we've looked at so far right mosses liverworts hornworts ferns lycopodium all of those so far have sporophyte plants that only produce one spore type but selaginella has an evolutionary leap in that now it produces two spore types. And I'll show you why that's important. So the, the two, so when there's more, when it's just one spore type, we just call it spore. It's just a spore. But if there's more than one spore type, we have to give it a name so that we can talk about them individually. And the names of the two types is microspore and megaspore. Remember I said earlier, we're going to use micro in a different way. This is how we're going to use it for the duration of the, of the class and in subsequent classes. Um, so, so that's what, that's what I was kind of leading up to back then. When you have a sporophyte plant that makes two spore types, the gametophyte, the gametophyte plant no longer grows outside of the spore. The gametophyte plant now stays inside of the spore, inside of the spore. The male gametophyte plants are going to stay inside of the microspores and the female gametophyte plants are gonna stay inside of megaspores. And so here is a comparison. So note, one male gametophyte per microspore, one female gametophyte plant per megaspore and micro as we go forward and now and as we go forward is going to refer to male and mega is going to refer to female and the reason that is is because in plants the female structures tend to be much bigger than the male structures and so that's how we differentiate them with the micro referring to male structures and mega referring to female structures just to give you an idea about that look on the left here this is from the same species of selaginella. We have a megaspore and a, mic and a lot of microspores. Look how big one megaspore is compared to one microspore, right? So that's why we call them that. The female gametophyte plant, sorry, I should not have used blue for that. Should not have used blue. Right, look how big the megaspore is compared to one microspore. Female gametophyte plant is going to be inside of this and stay inside. Male gametophyte plant is going to be inside of that microspore and stay inside. Okay. Um, that means that the gametophytes of Selaginella live in two houses, right? They're dioecious because they're each, the female gametophyte plant is inside of the megaspore, male gametophyte plant is inside of the microspore. Right. That's what I just said. Here is a close-up of a megaspore. You can see inside, that's the female gametophyte plant. She still has a few little rhizoids poking out to, oops, to kind of anchor, her, okay, anchor her to, uh, let's say, a rock. And obviously she's female gametophyte plant, so she's gonna have sex organs that bear eggs, right? So the archegonia are there. Male gametophyte plant's gonna grow inside of the microspore, and now, because the microspore is so small, you can't really have a lot of stuff jam-packed in there. And so, right, when you have a microspore, the male gametophyte plant has actually been reduced to just a single antheridium. One antheridium. That's all that the male gametophyte plant has left. So, remember remember the size difference on the previous slide, right? This, is, this microspore is big in comparison to the megaspore because we're trying to look at the stuff inside. Right, so one antheridium, that's it. That's it, inside of the microspore. Okay. Okay, um, we do have to go through the uh, alternation of generations in Selaginella. I'll go through it a little bit faster, but and highlight the main differences, because otherwise, otherwise it's basically the same as Lycopodium, just a couple little differences. So this is the full, the full alternation of generations for Selaginella here. Here we go. We have this um, 
megaspore and coming out of the megaspore is the young sporophyte plant, right? And here we go here. You have the sporophyte plant right here. And if we were going to look at the strobilis on the top of the sporophyte plant, now because we have megaspores and microspores, we actually have sporangium that make one or the other. This is one of the differences here. So instead of just sporangium, now we have a microsporangium. Guess what microsporangiums make? Microspores. And we have megasporangium. What do you think megasporangium makes, right? Megaspores. Inside of a microsporangium, you'll have lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of microspores because they're so small. Inside of a megasporangium, you'll only have four. Now you can only see three here because there's one. That's just how it is. But you'll have four megaspores per megasporangium. Eventually, microspore is going to get released. Eventually, megaspore is going to be released. Oh, and I should put out, point out, before we had sporophyll, so before we had, when we were talking about lycopodium, we had sporangium. There was only one type of spore. So we had sporangium and we had sporophyll, which was the leaf that the sporangium was on. Now we have microspores and megaspores that come from microsporangiums and megasporangiums. And so the leaves that those are on are called, respectively, a microsporophyll. The megasporophyll. So it's just, it's the same word as before, sporophyll, but now it tells you in the name megasporophyll what type of sporangium is on top of it, right? Still a sporophyll, but now it tells you it has microsporangium on top. So the megaspore and the megaspore are going to eventually leave the sporangia. And there you go. See, that's what I was just saying microsporophyll and megasporophyll. Oh, there you go. So I break it down for you in this little um, inset here. So this kind of breaks it down for you. You could read that. Um, and yeah, so the spores are going to leave. And inside of the microspore, you're going to have one antheridium, right? One antheridium. I'm trying to see if it, uh, yeah inside of the microspore you have one antheridium notice the color change right because the spores are are now haploid uh, so one antheridium inside of the microspore female gametophyte plant inside of a megaspore as she is poking out on the female gametophyte plant you have archegonia the single antheridium inside of the microspore is going to make sperm Eventually, sperm will be released. So what happens really is the microspore will land on the megaspore. And when that happens, the sperm inside of the microspore can swim down the archegonia of the megaspore and fertilize with the egg. And just to note, because this is different than what we've seen before, the sporophyte plants of Selaginella produce two spore types. The gametophytes now stay inside of the spores. And in, and as we said, that means that the gametophyte plants in this case are decid or, um, the, are dioecious because they're living in two separate houses. They're living in two separate spores. Okay. This is what I had just said. You know, the sperm fertilizes the egg, and then that gives you... Uh, when that happens, that's fertilization. That gives you this 2N zygote, which is going to grow via mitosis into a young embryo. And that will ultimately become, don't worry about this stuff. The, the point is, all right, ultimately, this young embryo is going to keep growing, keep growing, keep growing, and then grow into more of a sporophyte plant and this is that same so here on the left you see the megaspore with the sporophyte plant growing out of it <clears throat> this is what it looks like in real so that's the megaspore left over the root of the sporophyte plant and the shoot of the sporophyte plant with leaves and there you go <clears throat>
alternation of generations complete, right? Because we're back to where we started. Okay, I know it's a lot of information, but hopefully there's a lot enough repetition now where some of this is coming more easily for you. Um, I hope so. It usually does in my experience, so a lot of repetition. We're finishing out lab eight with the horsetails, which are also vascular plants and they're also going to shed spores. So these occur in our area. You may have seen them before. <clears throat> uh, common names for, oh, so the phylum is Equicetophyta. Equicetophyta. Phyta. Equicetophyta. Uh, but the commonly called either horse tails or sc scouring rushes. Scouring rushes, and I'll show you why they're called that. <clears throat> uh. So much talking. Mm. All right. This is how you pronounce equicetophyta. Kind of a fun word to say, right? Equicetophyta. Um, there's a lot of diversity in shape of the horsetails. Uh, the lab mentions that they're called articulates. The reason they're called articulates is because they they have jointed stems where you can pull them apart, <clears throat> almost like Legos. So they'll separate, they don't separate, they separate at the nodes like bonk, bonk, bonk. So you can pull them apart. Um, that's why they're called articulates. And <laughs> so the reason they're commonly called, <clears throat> the reason they're commonly called horsetails is because, um, so equus, equus is, comes from the word horse. And seta comes from hair. So here in the animal kingdom, there's a genus called equus. And look at all of the animals that are in that genus, right? Horse-like things, right? Um, but equicetophyta is like horse hair. And so there you go. <laughs> there you go. <clears throat> Whoever named the horse tails thought that the, the plant resembled a horse's tail, right? And so they named it equicetophyta. Little stretch of the imagination there, but um, you don't need to know this. But I just wanted to point out that the equicetophyta are also really important in so in our fossil fuels that we talked about in the first class that a lot of plants are used. A lot of fossil fuels were made from ancient plants. Um, one of those ancient plants is the horsetails, so they're significant in the formation of coal that we use today. Uh, it's a vascular plant so that we know the sporophyte generation has to be dominant. And there's only one genus in, uh, one living genus in Equicetophyta, and that is Equicetum. So that's easy. And there's only 20 species worldwide. And there are a few species that occur naturally in New Jersey area in our region. Uh, so this is one of those. This is Equiceta, Equicetum hyamale, which is shown here. And then this is Equicetum arvensi, which is shown here. Now, this to me looks more like a horse tail. Like this, no. This doesn't look like a horse's tail to me. If it is, it's like a sick horse, right? This doesn't look like a horse's tail. But this, I get it. Fine. Looks like a horse's tail. Fine. Bushy. <laughs> um, you probably see them around the lakes and water sources, also in disturbed areas like along train tracks. You might see them. They don't really do anything significant for humans in terms of economy. And actually, sometimes they can kill livestock because there is silica in the plant. And in the case of Equicetum, which is what, what's cool about it or different about it, is that in the sporophyte plant, it's actually the stems that perform photosynthesis, not the leaves, not the leaves. So look at these green stems, right? And they perform photosynthesis, not the leaves. And the stems are divided into nodes and internodes. Nodes and internodes we've already come across during the stem lab. But just as a reminder, here are the nodes on this horsetail. Oops. And the region between the nodes is called the internode, right? Okay. A lot of times the stem have this kind of vertical ribbing which helps the plant have mechanical support. So if you're growing in like the sides of water and things, you might get flooded occasionally, so you don't want to break. So the, the ribbing helps with mechanical support. 
Uh, and as I mentioned, there's silica inside of the epidermal cells. So one common name is horsetails. The other common name is scouring rush because people used to use horsetails to scour pans or clean pans. So if you've ever forgotten you were cooking and accidentally burned the bottom of your pan, you may have used, you know, Brillo pad or, or steel wool or something like that to clean it. Well, back in the old days, and actually you still could do this, people would use scouring rush because of the ribbing that the plant has and also the fact that it contains silica, which makes it feel almost like a plastic. Um, so we looked at the nodes on the previous side of the stem, previous slide of the stem. Branches occur at these nodes. So these things coming out here are branches. Uh, not all species have branches, right? Like we saw on the slide that I said, that doesn't really look like a horse's tail. That didn't have branches. And the one I said, that kind of looks like a horse's tail, right? That one has branches. Uh, if they are branched, there will be a leaf at every branch. Sorry, there will be a branch for every leaf. And the branches are world. Remember, we learned about opposite, alternate, world. So the leaves here are world, and if there's branches, there'll be a branch for each leaf, and so the branches are world too. And as I mentioned, the, the stem in Equisetum is actually what does photosynthesis, not the leaves. The leaves are actually really small and don't even look like leaves. So let's get, but purple's fine. So the leaves on Equisetum, they're very small. They're simple. They do have one vein, but hold on, I'll tell you more about that in a second simple leaves, world at the nodes, and there's about 20 or 30 per node, depending on the species. And most importantly, they're non-photosynthetic. So if you look, here is a node, here's a node, here's a node, here is a node. These weird things are the leaves, each of, each of these, right? So this, this species probably has around 30 leaves going around. Here is the leaves here. So they don't even look like leaves. They almost look like little bristles. Um, and even though they only have one vein, I want to point out they are still considered megaphils because they came from leaves that had many, they, they, they basically were, yeah, just trust me. <laughs> you don't need to know these details, but just trust me. They, uh, they are, they are megaphils only, the only living plants that have microphils, one vein microphils are the, the lycopods. Just want to clear that up there. Okay, just like we saw in the others, in the ferns and the lycopods, these have a horizontal stem called a rhizome, and the roots arise off of that horizontal stem. Now let's talk about the gametophyte generation. Um, same players as we saw before, right? Antheridium, archegonium, rhizoids. Pretty simple, flat, green thing, photosynthetic. Only one spore type in Equisetum, so the gametophyte plant grows outside of the spore wall, just like we saw with all the non-vascular plants and the ferns and lycopodium. And here is your alternation of generations for Equisetum. Uh, because of the repetition of the players here, I'm not gonna go through it really, really in detail, but what I will do is point out the differences. Here's our mature, Plant on the top is a strobilus, like we saw before. However, there's a new structure on the strobiluses that we saw before. Strobiluses, stroboli. On the stroboli that we saw before in the lycopo lycopods, it was a branch with leaves on it, right? Strobilus in Equisetum has a stem with these weird new things on them that are called sporangiophores. So this one has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight sporangiophores that you can see. Each sporangiophore kind of looks like a little mushroom and hanging underneath the, the cap of the mushroom are the sporangia. So each of these thing is a sporangia. And this is just another way for you to pack more sporangia into a smaller area and produce more spor spores for the same amount of area. So 
The only thing that has sporangiophores is equicetum. Um, as we saw before, four means to carry or bear. So the sporangiophore, here's one, sporangiophore. Remember I said it looks kind of like a mushroom. Here's one, here's another. Is a structure, structure that bears or carries sporangia. So you can have like 10 to 20 sporangia per sporangia four. Okay, I think we're getting close to the end here. Uh, the only other thing that's different about equicetum is that when the sporangia open, the spores are surrounded by these little curly things that help it wiggle out of the sporangium. So the curly things are gonna shift depending on humidity and it helps the spores kind of wiggle, wiggle their way out of the sporangia on the sporangia fork. Here are spores with the wiggly things on them, right? The wiggly things, the wiggly things are called elaters. Sorry, I should have mentioned that. So here is a, here's a spore. It's yellow because the spore is haploid. Here is a spore. Attached to the spore are these little wiggly ribbons that initially kind of are around it. When the humidity allows them to kind of move around, it's going to help the spore jump out of the sporangia. And this is what they look like in real. Um, so spore five plant only makes one spore type. Gametophyte plant, plant grows outside of the spore, just like we saw with almost all the other plants except Selaginella. And both male and female sex organs are on the same gametophyte plant, so we say that they are monoecious. Egg and sperm are going to come together. Fertilization, two end zygote is the product, which is the baby sporophyte plant. And that's going to grow via mitosis, and you're going to be back to your full mature sporophyte plant. Okay, we, we did it. Okay, we made it through the vascular plants that shed spores. Um, there is a homework assignment for this lab, so please, you should watch both both of the videos for lab eight before trying to attempt the homework assignment. It'll be available on Tuesday, um, starting around 8 p.m. And it is due by Thursday at 6 p.m. By Thursday by 6 p.m. Do the homework assignments. They let you see what kind of questions could show up on an exam. The homework assignments help boost your grade. Turn them in on time. Turn this one in by Thursday at 6 p.m., okay? And start getting organized getting your notes organized for lab exam two. The semester is almost over. Lab exam two is in nine days. So this class is being held on the 23rd, right? And the lab exam is on the 2nd of July. So we are wrapping up here. So um, we move very, very fast in the summer. So start getting ready. I will post a study guide um, pretty soon. It's it probably when you're watching this is already posted. So use the study guide to help you study. Okay, guys, thank you so much, and I will see you next time for the gymnosperms. All right, take care, guys. Thanks.